what I'm saying is that um, you, Ron, already introduced UiPath. I will give some insights what UiPath is all about. And the main focus will be on what is automation if you put it in a manufacturing context, including some applications so that it really becomes something that's tangible. Um, just for um, like a sort piece, um, obviously everybody is seeing like what you can do on like an enterprise side on the consumer side. Interestingly enough, now this becomes really something from an automation perspective and from an AI perspective where more and more industrial leaders are getting into it. So you see the signals here, especially around like 90% of large organizations will be in automation by 2023. So that's two years time. Um, so that's a strong signal. And therefore I think let's talk about what is the manufacturing automation opportunity. And then let's think about what we see in terms of application stories and what we can learn from that. And by the way, I have like roughly 20 minutes, so I won't go to the very details, but I will share my contact details. And if there is genuine interest, just feel free to reach out. Yeah. Um, so maybe just before we start, I just want to make sure that you at least get one thing out of that presentation, which is what is automation at the end of the day? And in a very simplistic way, Automation is really about emulating human behavior. That's that's what it really is at the end of the day. So you could think about a robot that can see, like reading the screen. He can really think. So this is enriched with AI and these kind of things. And the most important thing, a bot can then automate tasks across various applications and across various kind of like infrastructure setups that you have and then support humans behind that. And why do we strive for that? Because at the end of the day, it starts with, if you think about what you're doing on a daily basis, think about what you can automate. That's like the first step. And then you can assign a robot to that. Next thing is, and that's something that's currently really hot and at the forefront of automation. If you think about your employee base from like all the way R&D to sales, you can literally give every single employee the opportunity to work with a bot so that could be deep down in manufacturing shop floors, that could be in sales, that could be in headquarter functions. And by doing this, this really democratizes having bots there as well as like developing them because it's really then down to the employee to drive these kind of like developments. And last thing is you will see that in former days, this was all about like robots. These days, this becomes ever more tech intense, meaning it's enriched with like cognitive services, machine based learning. And you will see more and more as we go and see this um, evolution of that category. Um, with that, let me go into the opportunity and maybe frame a little bit what we are currently seeing. And this is like an automotive um, study that we did, but it cuts across different industries. Um, so if you think about where companies want to automate, one is they really think about what are their employees doing and how can they empower their employees to achieve more? So that's one big theme. And we have like a huge case study running with one of the premium automotive suppliers where we roll that out to the entire base there. Um, if you think about another industry, chemicals, um, we have a very interesting study currently running where we support sales in a way that sales is interested in chemicals, how price fluctuations from sourcing all the way down to the actual prices that they need to charge clients, how they can automate this. And this is a study that we just concluded. Um, one, I guess, of the most uh, mind blowing um, case studies that we have is with a major semiconductor um, manufacturer sitting in Taiwan. And what it basically is, it is the approach of taking automation all the way down to shop floor operations and really hardwire them into the operations. And another interesting study that we are running and continue to evolve is together with a Japanese auto OEM player where we really take a look into the end-to-end -end supply chain domain and what we could do with that kind of OEM. And that's a huge success that is by now more than already 46 million in like savings that we achieved there. Now, um, with that, and uh, just giving some surroundings there, I guess what is interesting is the question, 
what do you want to achieve with automation? And the good thing is early studies with the World Economic Forums do show that if you really master technology and if you are like an early adopter of these technologies, you can see success way beyond typical headcount attrition. So factory output, operating costs, inventory reduction, these are the kind of things. And what is the reason for that? Reason for that is when we started out, clients pretty much ask us under number five, can you help us automate G&A functions, let's say finance, HR, and IT? And then something happened because our clients took our products and they figured out we can take this pretty much everywhere across our supply chain. So they took us into R&D operations, the service organization, the selling side, and that's the interesting thing. And then if you think about the Roman capitals one and two, more and more clients now ask us for foundational services, meaning how can you tap all the way from data via IoT into analytics and security? How can you automate that one? That's a big one. And bigger even is um, Roman Capital 2, which is all about end-to-end -end automation workflows, which is currently at the very forefront of automation. And if this is the perspective within a company, you could take the same perspective and you could say, hey, this is no longer just within the walls of a company, it is really cutting across boundaries of companies. So what you will see more and more is that either you go from like a assembler perspective all the way upstream into your supply base. So that means you really think, how can I integrate all these suppliers into a seamless supply chain? How can I make that happen by means of automation? That's one like strong push that we see. And then the other thing, especially driven from the automation companies all the way up is the question, if you offer um, client solutions that are software-based, why not putting automation right into your product offering so that wherever you go downstream towards your clients, and that could go all the way down to like end consumers, how can you make sure that you offer automated services to your clients? And that's what we are seeing more and more. So upstream supplier or downstream customer integration. So um, with that, and that was a little bit of an introduction, let's quickly talk about signs and signals that we see when it really comes to application of um, automation. So um, some strong studies show that if you truly go for automation, that's like left-hand side, it's more than 65% that you can save there. That's a pretty strong signal that you can see. So all the respondents said, if we go aggressively for that, then 10% of OPEX is addressable. So that's huge if you are in manufacturing. Um, the other thing which is really important, especially if you think about like consumer goods in these kind of companies, that's very much down to the question of your inventory and how you handle that. Um, and that is something where a reduction of inventory without running out of inventory by more than 33% is possible driven by, by automation. And another thing, and then I stop with all the quotes, are the, the ones like the 71% as well as the 60%. The interesting thing is that A, you have a skill gap, that's the 60%, and B, you will have more and more tasks that will be automated by machines, that's the 71%. So you could see that if you are short on skills, you want to make sure that machines take over on that side. So that's a strong kind of like trend and signal piece that we see there in manufacturing. And with that, that's really about the question, why should I do that? And then what we see in terms of application, we see that a lot of companies are interested in the question, so what should I do or where should I focus? And what we do, and that's just a depiction for like R&D operations and supply chain, we work with our clients in a focused manner whereby we go with like heat maps and you would see like the dark um, amber ones being like the more interesting ones from a potential perspective. Um, and that's then the way how you start your journey because what we found out is you wanna make sure that you give it to employees so they can start automating in a manufacturing environment. But then on the same side, you want to make sure that you drive top down and that you have like senior exec support for that one. And I guess both ends meet if you work top down from the high impact, high potential ones, as well as like bottom up with the actual employees driving these kind of automations. 
and then success builds on success and that is then being monetized yeah that's that's what we see um in terms of um some examples um what we do have is as i already shared we have like horizontal views like really end-to-end -end automation views how in this case an automotive end-to-end -end value chain could look like with automation plays and then obviously you just don't want to have like a horizontal view end-to-end -end, but the actual lines of business owner they will pull you into like very concrete questions like how should i manage my inventory that's a case that we did with leah or how should we make sure that we automate dealer management that's a case that we did with red wing shoes so you have these balances that you need to strike between horizontal and then um, vertical and then if you do this in the right manner this is what you see is the the outcome of that so um we run a case study with two pretty mature and pretty successful um, automation players one being a korean player the other one being a japanese player stages and phases are almost equivalent to years and what you can see is that there is a nice ramp up um and by now in like korean like year two and a half it's already an ambition to go for more than 120 million us dollars which is quite some savings if you think an, an automotive player and same thing is for the japanese player and there the interesting thing is some companies will even go as far as to say if you are down in manufacturing and if you want to make a difference then you better make sure that you understand from a line of business perspective what your automation coverage is and that is what that client is specifically after um, and that's that's a strong signal that we see there as well um, with that kind of overview and i'm really going fast here so ron um, i hope that we have some time for questions if there are any um, let me jump to like the conclusion so i guess at the end of the day if you saw what you can do, how you can do this, and why you should do this, then the question becomes, how do you need to work on that from a user perspective, as well as from a platform perspective? And that is something that I wanted to share at the very end. So what we do see is that from an end user perspective, it really goes all the way from, you have process analysts, so they are really capable to dig into supply chain processes, shop flow processes, whatever it is. Then you will see more and more of these called citizen developers. So meaning actual employees that do drive development and democratize bots because they are literally running it on their desktops. So that's like the second pillar. And then obviously you need to work closely with IT operations to make sure that like with the friends that we have on AWS and like Microsoft, that everything that we do there really cuts across all the various applications as well as the hybrid cloud models that our clients are building up and then what we want to do is we want to make sure that business users and business analysts can tap into that potential and that's what we what we can offer with that end-to-end -end platform because what is that end-to-end -end platform you can think about it like an x-ray so you go for a discover phase whereby you have ai in there you have like process mining and these kind of capabilities so that's almost like your diagnostic kind of phase where you bring in on an automated and AI based manner the opportunities. Then you go into the build phase and we provide you with all the tools and me like um, capabilities that you need in order to build your automations very quickly. Then comes a very efficient module, which is all about like how you manage, deploy, and optimize your optim like automations there. And then obviously you have the runtime environments where your bots are running. And the nice thing is you can then directly tap and crowdsource where further potential is. So that engage is really, you engage with people and bring people together with bots and make sure that you crowdsource ideas and then execute them. And lastly, you would see on everything that you do from discover all the way to run, you would always have the capabilities and, and, and like the measurements to see whether you are going on a performance curve where you are like want to be there. Yeah. And from an existing um, application point of view, I mean, take take a read at that one down here. It's pretty much covering um, what we see. Um, then you have like obviously a lot of clients that still have like homegrown applications that we can tap into mainframe applications. So it's really an end-to-end -end capability that you have. 
And maybe a last thing, because I didn't want to end on a just mere tech perspective. I guess at the end of the day, this is not just about a sneezy new kind of technology offering. It's really about an open ecosystem. So what we made sure from a UI pass perspective is that we have an academy. So we make sure that we train and educate people that all the way goes down to like certification of employees. Um, we have a huge set of like partner technologies that we are able to integrate and that we build and use going forward. And then the nice thing is it's more and more about like community building and forums. So we bring together like different players in the industry and the value chain to make sure that they get the most out of that. And then as all the others are doing as well, we have a super marketplace where you will find more and you already do find more and more assets, vertical solutions that you can tap into and apply them ready to use. And obviously there is a super huge set of like global business partners to make sure that you have partners all the way from um, develop, run, and then maintain and um, further develop your bots. Yeah. And with that and being within the um, 20 minute, um, I guess one that then goes back to you and um, open for questions if there are any. Uh, got it. Thanks, Sebastian. And I see you're a little bit more relaxed now. You know, it's late in the day. What time, what's it, 7.30 in Germany or 8.30? Um, it's an 8.30 by now. Fine, so you're so able to take off your jacket and tie, so we're glad for that. <laughs> hey, yeah. I have a question for you myself. One of the things that we hear a lot about, and we see this at UiPath and automation, is powerful, these software robots and manufacturing applications. Are you also seeing any of your clients get so excited about the UiPath automation platform that they may have other standalone apps that are doing similar things, like for onboarding employees, dealing with help desk tickets, helping route people through normal uh, IVR kind of phone response for customers. One of the things, and I saw this when UiPath has presented in the, in the States, um, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I've got other applications, imagining this vendor for that, another vendor for a similar application. Are you finding companies wanting to do more with UiPath because your platform can be readily deployed in multiple functions and departments, which makes internal support so much easier? Yeah, so so two answers on that one, Ron. So good, good question, um, because first off, if you think about our solutions, these are like, almost like run on like virtual machines and running on desktops, right? So therefore we have a lot of connectors making sure that there's a seamless integration that could be toward IoT clouds connectivity, that could be towards like ERP systems, that could be towards like homegrown solutions, these kind of things. So that world comes with connectors, that's one answer. And then the other thing is what we did is, and you will see in our next release, so we go in, um, biannual releases, next one is in October, we acquired a company called Cloud Elements and Cloud Elements is really taking a different approach to automation, meaning you don't take the data and bring it to the workplace and then you start automating there, but Cloud Element turns it around and says, you go via APIs and then you take the automation right where the data sits. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the new things that we have and we have general availability of some of these API-driven solutions for automations starting by um, October. Oh, good. Well, that will be great new content for the AngelBee community at our fall programs. <laughs>